how are we building policy infrastructure where we're actually listening to the people in the classrooms uh, to understand, one, how classrooms actually operate on a day-to-day -day basis. This is so critical. And I think something that you know, our educators, and our superintendents, and our administrators, they have this information and our policymakers need this information. Welcome, everybody, back to another exciting and special episode of the Indisrupted Podcast. Uh, we get guests from all over. We're, I'm excited to invite a guest up in just a second. But of course, before I tell you who our guest is, we do have to have our opening debate. So, Adam, opening debate. Uh, we talked about this a lot during the pandemic, but now it's kind of an interesting topic. Should we have cellular devices, meaning like cellular built into devices like Chromebooks, laptops, iPads, or should we just hand out hotspots when you're dealing with one-to-one -one and also that equity and, and access at home? Where do you land on this? Yeah. Well, when I look at this question, it's one of those where it kind of depends on the market or your area that you serve. Because You could have cellular in your devices and not have any towers where the students are. So or even a hotspot. So we have to keep in mind what kind of cellular coverage we have in those areas. But I know me personally, we ran into a situation where I wish we would have had cellular devices during the pandemic versus the hotspots, because it really turned into now providing, we were given one hotspot to a household, but that really didn't meet the needs when every kid really needed a hotspot. And if we we're leaning to this anywhere, anytime learning, then having cellular built into that device makes all the difference. Like my cell phone, my, my, my cell phone has cellular on it. So I can literally get online wherever I'm at location. I don't have to worry about joining a Wi-Fi. Uh, so I, I'm leaning a little bit more to having it built into the devices. And I know it's going to make the cost of the devices go up a little bit, but and that's kind of where I'm leaning. What say you, Hooker? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. In my head, I'm like, okay, it makes most sense just to have it built into the device because that to me is like, okay, it's one less thing to lose, one less thing to break. However, I do think there is a repair cost here when you think about, okay, now if the cellular is not working, there might be some limitations based on those cellular. Again, you mentioned there's some people in certain areas that don't get access to certain towers. I've noticed like, for instance, if I have like a T-Mobile hotspot, but I'm running a Verizon, by the way, neither of which are sponsors of this podcast officially yet, um, that I can't. Yeah, I like that yet. I like that yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it may not matter. It, like, it depends on which one is best. And so sometimes to play the hotspots against each other is nice for that flexibility. But the truth is, at the end, we should just ask Elon to make sure that there's a satellite that gives us all of this electronic <laughs> and internet coverage. That is the final answer. Uh, but maybe there's other answers out there. And that's why we are excited to invite onto the show today, Jennifer Ellis. She's the director of state government relations at all for ed, the amazing organization, of course, that is a part and the, the reason why this podcast exists in the first place. Uh, Jennifer, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Where do you fall on that debate first? Where are you at on the, do you, do you have a leg to stand on in terms of, is it built into the device or should we just hand out hotspots? I could see, I could see it both ways. I think I'd have to go back to what Adam said, which is that it depends on the area. I think there's like different locations where having an external hotspot would ultimately be more helpful for students and families. But I could also see the benefit of having it all in one device because then everything you need is in your pocket anywhere you go. And we know that our families right now learning is really mobile. You know, it's not just happening in your home or in the classroom. It's happening everywhere. People are looking stuff up everywhere. So the benefit of being able to have that with you at all times without moving the external hotspot makes a lot of sense to me also. Yeah, it's really one of those things where you look at those gaps. It's it's creating that inequity uh, with, with access. I mean, that's that's that digital divide we're, we're talking about, that, that equity and access. And I know at states, uh, we talk about different policies and things that they could do. So, so Jennifer, this is you're the expert in, in policy. We, we, we got an expert here. Um, you know, what does digital equity mean in the state policy space? As we start talking about, like, what can states do to, to fix this issue? Yeah, I, it's a great question. I think it's a really complex issue. And this is something that I think it's missed sometimes when we talk about digital equity, particularly in state policy. Um, you know, I think too often when we think about tech, we think about digital equity, we think about educational technology, we're thinking about devices, we're thinking about broadband, um, and which makes sense. These are really important components of the conversation. But 
it is so much more complex than that. And we really need to take an approach, particularly among our state policymakers, that looks at this from 360 degrees. Because if you give out devices, um, those devices aren't any good if you don't have the ability to repair or get access to IT support or taking another level, getting access to IT support in a language that is spoken in your home. You know, if your family can't access the IT support, it might as well not be there. So we also have to think about things like how is that tech fully integrated? So it's not just something that's added on to what you're doing, but is actually fully integrated into the classroom and into your life. And that requires training for educators, for administrators, for superintendents. So it is actually this very deep, complex issue that touches all these different policy facets. And I think that is one of the things that's most important to understand about the digital equity conversation, particularly in state policy, is that we need to be addressing all of these pieces um, what we know right now is innovation in the digital space is only going to go up from here. We're not going to take steps back. So we need to be building this infrastructure. And again, I say infrastructure, um, some of that is physical infrastructure, uh, like actually getting broadband out to areas. But I'm also talking about policy infrastructure, social infrastructure. If we're building this now, then we're going to be ready not only for the tech that's here today, but what we know is coming very, very quickly tomorrow. And so I think there's a real opportunity in education policy to be grappling with these questions that are really, really complex and thinking through them in a way that sets up students not just for education, but we also have the opportunity to teach our students how to be good digital citizens, how to parse fact from fiction. And these are things that we should be talking about in the digital equity space and what schools can do in the digital equity space. So I think it's important that whenever we're talking about it, about digital equity, we are capturing all that complexity. It's not just about devices. Devices aren't really important. Uh, without them, we don't have any part of the conversation, but it can't stop there. That's just the beginning. Yeah, I would hope that these state policymakers are talking about things like digital citizenship and then also that kind of equity of access. I think that needs to be something that's talked about across the board. You mentioned the devices, and you know, and we've seen you know, a lot of different federal resources going toward technology, specifically devices, broadband access, things like that, uh, including the American Rescue Plan funding. Um, what are you seeing right now in the state policy space? Because right now we know that there's, you know, there's some funding cliffs coming in certain areas. Um, so state policymakers who are thinking, okay, we really want to do this, but we know that there's some federal funding that's maybe changing. They're kind of grappling with the reality of what's going to happen in the future with that funding. Um, what do you see happening on the state level in that sense? So I think a lot of our state policymakers are having these conversations about what does it mean for this federal funding to end? Where does state funding have to step in? But one of the things that I think is really important that's at the center of these conversations is we can't just ask the question of how do we address this current funding cliff? We have to also think about how do we make this funding into the future sustainable and reliable for our superintendents and our schools. Um, one of the things that we know about tech, I mean, anyone who has a smartphone in their pocket right now, you're not going to have that smartphone for the rest of your life. Um, it's going to break, it's going to need repair, but also it's just going to be redundant at some point. It needs to be replaced. Um, our education technology is no different. So if we get one big bucket of funding and every school is able to buy a laptop for every student, Okay, that's incredible, but those laptops are not going to be good anymore in just a few years. So how are we actually building in funding streams that schools know that they're going to be able to rely on to purchase new tech, to train new staff, to repair when they need to repair? Um, and the only way to do that, like I said, is to actually have policy levers that offer reliable funding that schools can look ahead to and rely on. And so where there are a lot of good conversations happening about the federal funding is going to end. How do we make sure it's spent correctly? How do we make sure we're stepping in when the money is gone? Um, we really need to make sure that our policymakers are having these conversations about not just this moment, but knowing that tech is going to continue to become more complex, is going to be continued innovation. How do we build in funds for the future um, and make sure that our schools, our superintendents, our educators know that they can rely on the fact that that funding is coming so that they can fully feel comfortable utilizing all of this great technology, hardware, software, everything into their curriculum. They know it's not going to cut off at some point because the money runs out. Yeah, I mean, I always look at it like this. Uh, we have to invest in our children uh, and it's child support. 
<laughs> I mean, simply put, it's child support. The, the, we have to support our children. Um, you know, these are the things that they need. We have to provide the funding for that. And when you cut the funding, it's like you can't cut child support. Like, you know, what, what are we going to do? <laughs> you're, you're like, you can't tell the school systems to figure it out when we know uh, this is a, a huge investment. That's a continual investment uh, that we have to keep having those resources for continual training, as you mentioned, with technology changing. It's always going to need some funds to do those things. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I find that that's like the that's like the number one reason why a lot of staff don't really invest their time and energy into integration of technology because they seem to be like, well, uh, we can do this thing, but you know, in about two years, it's all going to go away, or we don't know what's going to happen, or maybe it's going to change. Well, the truth is, like you said, Jennifer, it's always changing, it's always iterating, it's always evolving. So we just need to make sure that our policies also change and evolve to go along with those times. And I think that's the challenge because technology does have. I mean, compared to like desks and buses, a very short life cycle. So how do we replace that? Yeah, that's a big part of it. Absolutely. So here's the thing. We're, we're having a great conversation. And I'm always one of those people where I'm like, okay, it's great to have a conversation. But are you talking to the people who can actually make things happen? You know, you don't want to be in a circle and say, oh, man, I really hate this. And no, no one in that circle can actually enact any change or knows the next step. So let me ask you this as, as educators, superintendents, you know, how do they fit into this policy conversation around digital equity, um, technology education? What's that? What, what can they do to enact change on policy? Yeah, you know, I think the role of educators, superintendents, administrators here is critical. And uh, I think part of the conversation really has to be helping our policymakers have access to the opinions, the observations of our educators, our superintendents, our administrators on a more regular basis and earlier in our policymaking process. And education policy is not alone in this. I think we can all think of many examples of policies that maybe looked good to policymakers on paper, but when they were rolled out into the real world, they missed some fundamental piece of like how the world actually functions. And the policy ultimately was not successful. And I think, you know, putting myself in the shoes right now of an educator, um, you know, the point that you made about how do you invest in these new technologies and innovations when every two years you're like, oh, here's a new administration with a brand new idea and a brand new, like, and they're not listening to what we're saying. That's incredibly, incredibly frustrating and demoralizing. And so I think it's really important that when we talk about how we're building these policies, part of the infrastructure is not just the infrastructure of how the technology goes out, but how are we building policy infrastructure where we're actually listening to the people in the classrooms uh, to understand, one, how classrooms actually operate on a day-to-day -day basis. This is so critical. And I think something that you know, our educators and our superintendents and our administrators, they have this information and our policymakers need this information. And you, know, you can't incorporate anything into the classroom, but especially new technologies, things like this, if you don't understand on a day-to-day -day basis how the classroom actually operates. Um, and then I think getting their input early and often as policies are implemented, because a policy might work on day one, but it doesn't work two years later because something has shifted. And that's okay. Policy is meant to be flexible. It's meant to change. But we're not going to know those changes are needed if we're not listening to those who are really the most in the know. I also think another piece of this is when we're investing in technology, how are we investing in our educators? So if we're going to roll out a brand new system of technology, are we offering our educators the opportunity to be robustly trained and get professional development or certifications in that if they want that? Are we incorporating it into our education schools and programs for the next generation of teachers? And are we creating flexibility in our technology funding for districts to be able to offer those kind of supports? Um, because I think we've all heard stories of situations where educators come in for the first day um, of the school year and they're just told, here's the new curriculum, here's the new technology, here's the new, like, how are they being supported? Also, how are we making sure that our educators have access to fast broadband and the devices that they need? Um, so, you know, we have to be taking care of them as well. And so I think the only way we're going to know if we're taking care of them is by listening. Um, and so that's one of the things that I think is so important that we build. And it's definitely not unique to education policy and that we need our policymakers to have a better insight into what's actually happening on the ground. But I think particularly here 
when we're talking about the classroom, how fast things can change in education, how complex things can be. Um, we have policy experts in education in every classroom in America. We need to be listening to them. And policymakers are not going to be able to adequately do their job until we're building in ways that we can hear those voices consistently um, and we can have mechanisms to gather that feedback and have it brought up to the legislature. So it's something that I know there's different states working on, but I also think, you know, reaching out to educators who might be listening, I think having your voice heard, going to hearings, mobilizing with your fellow educators, reaching out to nonprofits in your local area that are doing education advocacy, your voice is so critical. Um, and it needs to be in the room. It absolutely needs to be in the room for these decisions to be ultimately effective for you and effective for your students. Well said, well said. Yeah, that part about the, the, the big thing for me is like I've testified before, but I'll be honest. I mean, an administrator or an educational consultant coming into a room, they aren't going to listen to me as much as they are a teacher, like you just said, or a student. So getting those people in front of legislators. And I love that you pointed out, you know, that we need to be listening to those in the classroom, educators, administrators, superintendents. I would also stretch that to the legislator. I mean, I've invited legislators to come like go into classrooms, actually walk around and see what's happening versus, you know, kind of sitting in your ivory tower and making decisions. So I think that's a big part of this discussion. Another part of this discussion too, that we haven't hit on yet really is with all the new technology, with all the changes and, you know, we've got AI, which has been around for a while, but now it's becoming this big hot button topic, you know, student privacy, stu uh, um, student safety, all of these things start to come into the conversation. Um, how, how, where does that fit in all of this conversation? Because we've talked about funding, we've talked about the devices, we've talked about access and equity, but now there's this also this layer that we have to be concerned with the student privacy. Where does that play in all of this? Yeah, I think it's a really important part of the conversation. And I think it's a part that there are great organizations and policymakers working on this, but I think often we don't we don't talk about this enough as these uh, we're talking about new technology and how exciting all this stuff is and the great opportunity, which is all true. But we also have to be thinking about the first thing is obviously student data privacy, making sure that anything that we roll out is keeping our students data private and confidential and that that's built into anything that we're building. And then I think something that's even more complex than that is this concept of like full cybersecurity. Like what does it mean to be safe in an online space? And this is a conversation that I think extends again beyond education, but particularly when we're dealing with our students who are minors, if we are inviting them into an online space, the same as when we're inviting them into our school buildings, how are we keeping them safe there? And I mean safe obviously from their data being released but also safe from harassment, safe from bullying, safe from like, how do we understand those spaces? Um, I know early in the pandemic, there was um, this kind of uh, outbreak of Zoom bombing where people would like get into these classroom Zooms and like shout things or say obscene things. It's like when we create these spaces for students, just like if if our students were sitting in a physical classroom and someone like ran in and screamed something, like, that would not be acceptable. And so we have to be building security in and one of the things I think is most interesting in this conversation is, you know, who are the most savvy technical operators in many of our schools? It's the students. Uh, students are, they're on the, the front lines of technology. They know how to do all this stuff. They know how to manipulate these systems. They're really smart and savvy. And for us to be able to keep our students safe, we have to have such a deep understanding of how these systems operate so that we can identify and anticipate where there might be a threat uh, that could get into the system. And I think one of the best ways we can do that, and again, going back to listening, but it, in this part is listening to our students. <laughs> students are going to understand how those systems work, and they're going to be able to identify for you where there's parts where things can break down. And having students be partners with you in building a safe space, identifying what that means, and helping to build it and maintain it, I think is absolutely, absolutely critical. And one thing I want to add here is, this is such an important conversation, but it is really important that policymakers do not say, oh, that's great. Let's put a line at the end of our bill that says schools have to keep their students safe. <laughs> um, this can't be on the shoulders of like individual educators or individual even superintendents. This is going to require building systemic uh, like pieces. So the state really has to be providing support, providing funding, providing like continuing resources, like technology experts who can come out and consult or who can help build these systems. This shouldn't just be 
uh, like left at the discretion of the school and without funding, without support. And they're just like, well, I hope you have some safe spaces for your students online. No, this has to be thought about as fundamentals of these policies. And states need to be thinking about how they build a whole system where they're supporting every single school in doing this. Um, we can't expect our educators to not only be expert classroom educators and supports for their students, but now also be like tech savvy coders who are going to get into these systems and fix all the bugs. Like we need to be providing those supports for them as well. So I think by the state actually creating thoughtful policy around this, where we're offering that support and then listening to our students about where things are up and coming and changing, they really, they have their finger on the pulse of this. And I think those steps are going to take you a pretty far way in being able to anticipate where there might be issues. Um, and making sure that these spaces, just like any physical space where we would invite our students, are safe and private and allow our students to thrive and learn and grow. Yeah, I, I think the one thing that you that I kind of got from that, well, one of many, <laughs> is we're just figuring this out ourselves. It, it, it's one of those things, ultimately, we have to be honest that we're figuring it out as it goes, because as technology changes, the data that we need to keep safe changes. Because at one point, who would have thought your birthday would be some piece of information that's just super secret and no one can find out? But people are now manipulating different things on your birthday, your phone number. Uh, if your phone number can get out now, somebody can spoof your number and send text messages. So it's, it's all these things that we're worried about today that we didn't worry about yesterday. Um, and as it keeps going, we have to keep continuously be aware of those things. And school systems, to your point, may not have the staff in place uh, to do that because cybersecurity, data, privacy could be that and in someone's job where they're doing all these other things and data security, data privacy. So it, they get to it when they get to it. So you definitely brought up some really great points there. Yeah. And I think that's such an important point, Adam. And, you know, I guess kind of returning back to the first uh, conversation we had, um, it's going to keep changing. Right. So we might build an incredible privacy and cybersecurity system. And we're like this. We really have hit it. But that tech is going to change in six months to two years. So, right. You have to build in that constant learning and constant iterating. Um, in, in some ways, you know, we ask our students to be lifelong learners, constant learners. Uh, we're going to have to be constant learners <laughs> as this technology develops. And we're going to have to build into our policy the ability and flexibility to be those lifelong learners and to kind of ride the wave as this tech develops and anticipate and address new things and realize what we're, we're going to make some mistakes. And then we just have to work together as a team with all of the players to, uh, to fix and address them. And like I said, there's a lot of opportunity in this technology. So I don't want it to sound daunting or scary. Really, this is a really exciting time. Um, but we just have to be aware of the challenges and committed to facing them together and to having our policy systems at the state level work to support our educators and our superintendents as they are assessing and making these changes and adapting to these things in real time. Yeah, the one thing that's con uh, constant and consistent in education, especially in technology, is change. That's uh, something we can definitely know will happen. Uh, I do think it's important to have organizations, uh, especially state organizations, be a part of this change. But having someone like Jennifer Ellis, folks, this is Jennifer Ellis, the Director of State Government Relations at Alfred. Having you uh, be a part of this conversation is so important. And I, and I thank you for all the work that you do to help with these policies on the state and on the federal level. And thank you also for joining the show. No, thank you for having me. It's been great. Yes, I'm giving you a hand right now. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, Adam's knuckles have made an appearance, the infamous knuckles. Thank you so much for <laughs> thank you so much for joining us and for our listeners out there. Be sure to subscribe and give us a review. We'd appreciate it. We might even give you a shout out on a future show. This has been the Undisrupted Podcast brought to you by All for Ed. He's Adam and you can follow him at Ask Adam 3 on the Twitter. And he's Carl, and you can follow him at Mr. Hooker. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we are better together. And we are better undisrupted. undisrupted.